Welcome everybody again to the um, first Mobility On Demand on ramp program lessons learned webinar. Um, today's webinar is going to be focused on uh, three projects uh, participating in this project in this program um, that have been addressing um, from ideas for mobility integration. The agenda for today, we're gonna to have a couple of opening remarks from uh, the Federal Transit Administration and the Sergius Mobility Center. And then we're gonna move into the um, presentations of the three uh, participant agencies um, that have been working on um, mobility integration projects, uh, Capital Metro, Indigo, and Tompkins County. And finally, we're gonna address the Q&A session at the end of the webinar. So for today's speakers, um, uh, it's my pleasure to introduce, uh, I'm gonna speak, I wanna present all of them first and then each of them will do their presentation. So representing the Federal Transit Administration, we have Rick Obstelten, he's um, a program manager of the FTA. Uh, Rick's uh, work life is dedicated to creating a complete trips for all. Um, as a program manager with the FTA Office of Mobility Innovation, he helps lead the Integrated Mobility Innovation Demonstration Program, the Accessibility Transportation Technologies Research Initiative, and a variety of related efforts that help ensure the public transportation system serves everyone as effectively as possible. Previously, Rick oversaw technical assistance centers on mobility management and accessibility and worked to better coordinate human service transportation at the federal level. In his free time, Rick works to advance Dutch style cycling culture and he's locally notorious for his twice daily suited three wheeled crossing of the Potomac coffee in hand. Um, representing Cap Metro, um, Chad Valentine, Vice President for Demand Response and Innovative Mobility. Um, Chad is, um, he oversees uh, this uh, demand response program the main programs in this division are the Metro Access ADA Paratransit Program and the on-demand service called PCAP. Chad also leads Capital Metro's various innovative initiatives such as micromobility partnerships, bike share, retire vehicle exchange program, and all other programs initiatives that don't fall under the traditional definition of fixed route public transportation. Chad is playing a central role in moving Cap Metro from a transit provider to a holistic mobility provider in the region and he earned a master's in community and regional planning from the University of Texas at Austin. Representing Indigo, um, there's Lauren Day, who served as the Director of Public Affairs for four years at Indigo and oversaw the agency's public affairs and mobility partnership teams during a successful transit referendum in 2016 and the opening of the state's first electric BRT, the Red Line, in 2019. She now owns City Strategy, where she continues to work on mobility, city, and public projects. And she's still car free. Join Lauren Austin Gibble. He's a program, uh, project development planner with Indigo. Within this role, Austin serves as the NEPA manager for the agency Futures Bus Rapid Transit Lines, a capital project manager for downtown transit facility improvements, a manager for the rollout of the Fair Car Retail Network and baseline spatial analysis for the Purple Line BRT and other strategic planning efforts. At site work, Austin serves as the board of directors for the uh, CNU Midwest and Young Professionals in Transportation Indianapolis, as well as on the advocacy committee for Bike Indianapolis. Finally, Wen Zhang Li worked with Dwight Mengel on the Tompkins County Mobility as a Service Pilot Program and serve as a project assistant for uh, that initiative. He is now a PhD student in city and regional planning at Cornell University and focuses on the impacts on urban form on people's mobility choices. So those are gonna be our speakers for today. And we're gonna hear first from Rick Obstelten from the FDA. Rick. Hey, thanks very much Alvaro and uh, thanks everybody on the phone. Alvaro, you did a very nice job uh, introducing me um, and sort of speaking a little bit about the work that I do. and. Um, you know, I feel especially lucky to do the work I do because I have the chance to work with some really innovative projects and people, especially uh, the folks who were involved in the on-ramp. You know, this is really an opportunity that we take a lot of pride in to you know, work with innovative, smart, creative people who are really trying to 
you know, find the leading edge in mobility innovation. We need those kinds of partnerships because our office is small and our budget is too. But um, you know, the resources that we do invest, and primarily that's invested in uh, demonstration type services, you know, the type activities, that allows us to work with folks like you all on the call today who are also you know, hoping to learn from the experience of the uh, on ramp projects and help us understand really where we can find those sort of key activities that will move forward the vision we have of complete trips for all. Because we believe that if we can find a success and opportunity in one place, we can help it take root in another. And so that's why we're here for this webinar today. I'm very thankful you know, for the SUMC team for putting it on and for the agencies participating and sharing their knowledge. The, um, the on-ramp projects were competitively chosen because they showed they were ready to innovate, that they could especially benefit from the very special in-depth, in-person, on-the-ground technical assistance that was offered through this program by our partners with the Shared Use Mobility Center. That you know, especially high-touch level of support was meant to really help us test approaches that have that kind of rep replicability that I spoke of, right? But that show us ways to engage in um, you know, creative, iterative design, for example, in ways to bring together uh, disparate ideas to come up with that key that will move mobility for a local community forward, to help us find ways to iterate, to fail quick and fast and cheaply, to, um, to take the flexibility we need to move forward, to you know, spread messages in a way that allows for projects to, um, to be successful. It's that package of activities that you're going to hear more about today that really allowed this program to function as a incubator, uh, you know, both for the kinds of mobility concepts that, uh, that we'll be hearing about today, but also, as I said, for those very important ancillary components of the engagements uh, that help to design a successful project, the partnerships that help to implement them as well. And we hope to see that some of the ideas that you'll hear about today can find their way into demonstration and eventual widespread use. So, you know, I'm happy that we have the opportunity to, um, you know, with our office and, and with our partnerships across the rest of the Department of Transportation as well, have ways in which to move ideas like what we'll discuss today forward into implementation, whether that's uh, through the Integrated Mobility Innovation Program that we've recently begun the launch of, through the uh, Accelerating Innovative Mobility Effort, the ITS for Us Complete Trip Demonstration Program that was recently announced. Right? All of these activities that the um, department is putting forward, and I appreciate Oliver having put together, uh, having put, put this uh, uh, image of our website on the screen. I'd like you all to take the time if you can to have a look. All of our activities are really meant to do essentially what this program and this conversation today allows us to also do, to find those kernels of innovation, those uh, bits of intelligence, those new partnerships, those new solutions that can help us achieve the goal we have of complete trips for all and uh, the ability of, of our communities to connect, to move forward together. And I thank everybody on the phone for the work that you've uh, done as, um, as on-ramp projects in the first place. And for those who are here to listen and learn, I appreciate your willingness to do that. And I look forward to the opportunity to work with uh, everyone here to, um, to, to move our shared vision forward. So thank you, Aldro, thank you to the SMC team, and uh, I appreciate the chance to speak to you all today. Thank you very much, Rick, and thanks to the FTA for continued support in uh, innovation projects in mobility. Um, next, um, I'm going to briefly present some of uh, SAMC's role here. Um, forgot to introduce myself. My name is Alvaro Villagran. I'm a program manager at the Shared Use Mobility Center, and I've been the lead for uh, the on-run program. So for those of you who are not familiar with the Shared Use Mobility Center, we're a non-for-profit organization working in the public interest with the mission of creating a multimodal transportation system that works for all. Uh, we work in urban, suburban, and rural um, communities uh, all across the U.S. Um, the Shared Use Mobility Center provides strategic planning, technical assistance, applied research, and partnership facilitation uh, through different uh, programs and products. One of the most um, relevant um, platforms that we use uh, 
for, for the MOD effort. It's our learning center. You can visit um, the website that um, includes um, case studies for different projects, learning models um, based on modes and different technologies, as well as um, tools to promote the benefits of shared mobility for all. Regarding the MOD on-run program, uh, the main objective for this uh, program has been to serve as an incubator to develop innovative mobility ideas and to convert them into implementable plans. Uh, so I was supporting a, a planning program, a planning process um, to uh, foster those, those innovative ideas and move them for into implementation. Uh, the MOD on-ramp also participated in a community of transit agencies that are investing and developing different type of mobility on demand projects. And um, the program serve as a, as a forum to connect uh, those agencies participating in this space. And as this webinar witness, uh, this program also um, has an objective to create practical knowledge and lessons learned that could inform other transit agencies and the industry as a whole uh, to promote mobility on demand programs. Initially, a little bit of history. Um, the first program in the MOD uh, space sponsored by the FTA was the Sandbox, where 11 projects were selected to participate um, in implementation of their projects. And then OnRamp came into uh, play as, again, as an incubator for projects that have good ideas, but they were not ready yet for implementation. And as Rick mentioned, these um, efforts from the FTA supporting mobility on demand and innovative projects, um, it's moving forward through the um, Integrated Mobility Innovation project Program, as well as the Accelerated Innovation Mobility. The on-run program um, received um, multiple applications. We received about 40 applications after we submitted the um, call for applications and hosted a webinar to explain the, um, the objectives of the program. Um, something that is important to um, share with you is that the projects were evaluated by um, independent group of reviewers from public, private, and non-profit sectors. And uh, it was a criteria-based project selection. Um, so we have a very um, um, participatory type of um, project selection the on-run program has been going on for um, almost two years. And during that time, the Shared Use Mobility Center had provided technical assistance to the six participant agencies in developing uh, their plans through um, the different um, actions that you uh, can see in this slide, including um, project building strategy, facilitating partnerships, and um, doing the plan development and identifying sources of funding to move the projects forward. Some of the activities that we conducted via the um, on-run program included um, the technical assistance. We have monthly calls with all the participant agencies, have some webinars with experts, and uh, very particular to this uh, MOD program, um, we have the opportunity to work more closely uh, with the participant agencies and the, the partners and stakeholders in their communities, which involve um, on-site on -site visits uh, to discuss the projects as well as local workshops to figure out the best routes to move the project forward, as well as the national workshop that we have uh, hosted um, in, in the year 2019. So you can see here some images of our local workshops and site visits and um, the images of our uh, national workshops that included um, presentations by experts in different mobility on demand topics. And just to wrap up on my part, uh, lessons learned, we um, are happy to see that um, the on-run program uh, projects are moving towards uh, implementation. Um, that's part of the uh, goal and even if uh, some of the COVID uh, 19 context is uh, uh, creating some barriers. The projects are um, moving forward. And you will hear in this uh, webinar today that transit agencies are becoming mobility integrators uh, through different projects, um, that all of them involve innovative partnerships, um, integrating technologies, 
and have a customer centric approach to expand mobility options for all. That I invite you to visit uh, the Share Use Mobility Center website to learn more about that. And now we're gonna start the presentations of all the three uh, on-run participant agencies uh, of today's webinar. So we'll start with Capital Metro in Austin and Chad is gonna be speaking and telling you more about this project. Chad, the floor is yours. All right, thank you very much, I appreciate it. Um, so today I'm gonna to talk uh, about our on-ramp project. It's been a very interesting road we've gone down. We actually started as um, working on autonomous vehicles and um, that project was quick to fail, but um, we actually um, pivoted and we were able to turn our project into a bike share and transit um, partnership, which has actually been a pretty amazing thing and we're really excited that this has happened because it's been um, a pretty cool thing for us. So I'll talk to you today about our partnership with the city of Austin and Capital Metro um, on, our, on our bike share program. Next slide. I don't know if I've got that or you've got that. There you are. So what we've been, uh, what we were talking about and really kind of coming up with the idea of really connecting bikes and transit. We know bikes and transit have been um, correlated for a long time. I don't think that's a shock to anyone, but um, really focusing in on the electrification of bikes, e-bikes, um, it's, it's uh, been a really big change. It's really kind of been a shift on how people are using bikes. We also really wanted to do this because we wanted to expand our reach and not just service bus routes, but look at it beyond, um, beyond just where the transit goes and really look at mobility. So bikes might actually be a really good answer for areas where we don't have the ability to put in a bus or it doesn't make sense to put in a bus. So it allows us to expand our service area and our reach. And then also a partnership with the city is vital. I think it's really important. Um, we've sometimes we find that transit agencies and cities work in their own vacuums and their and their in their own silos, and so we never really cross pollinate. And really, to make something like bikes and transit work together very well, the partnership is incredibly important. Next slide. So the partnership, um, what we're talking about, is uh, the city of Austin and Capital Metro. We're looking to rebrand it and call it Metro Bike. Uh, that just goes along lines with our Metro bus, Metro rail, Metro everything else. Um, so we really wanted the community to start seeing the bike share program in Austin as just another offering of the transit agency. Because again, moving from transit to mobility, and that's a really big important piece for us. The city of Austin has um, owned and operated this program with the help of a nonprofit since 2013, but um, it's kind of, you know, they're not transit providers, they're not really mobility providers. They actually provide all the oversight for the scooters and bikes in town. Um, they come up with the rules and they also enforce the rules. And so um, we all got together and decided, maybe it makes more sense for the, the bike share program for the city to be living with Capital Metro. And the city of Austin gets out of the really, as much as possible kind of gets out of the, the running that business on its own. Um, you click again, I think it shows our third partner. So the reason why this one was incredibly complex is because the city of Austin had already owned all the assets, has been running the program for uh, since 2013 with Bike Share of Austin. It's a nonprofit. They do the day to day operations. So we wanted to get in on the game. The city of Austin wanted us to get in on the game. And this is where the Shared Use Mobility Center on ramp program helped us a lot because a lot of technical assistance we needed in order to structure these agreements and the partnership um, because the cities just can't hand over assets to another um, government agency or entity. Um, it's just not that easy. So we needed to, you know, make sure contracts were in place or, you know, um, we've got procurement rules as well. So once we get into a new business, instead of us having to re-procure from start um, and actually just assume an existing business, that's, that's also another tough one. So we had a lot of legwork to do in the back end legally to kind of make all of this work. So next slide. But, um, but we are all have an agreement on the overall idea and the vision for Metro bike. Again, we're going to, we're going to change it from the B cycle system, which is a nationally known um, system. We're just going to rebrand it Metro bike. 
We're going to integrate it with our um, online app, our mobile payment app, and also our uh, our trip planning service. So we actually just finished rolling out the ability to trip plan from your house to a bike, to a bus, back to a bike, and to your final destination, or any any mix of that. So that's been pretty exciting. Um, and we, in the coming months, plan to actually integrate that into one payment. So we have a day pass and um, a month pass is what the plan would be. Um, so that you can just, if you buy a day pass, you can ride the buses or the bikes all day long for one low price. Um, because we know there's, um, there's a symbiotic, symbiotic relationship between the bikes and the buses. And so we really wanted to capture that. And we think that'll be a really, really cool product for us as well. Next slide. So again, and we, we, we even decided to look beyond the Metro bike, uh, just the bikes and getting them integrated with a pass. We wanted this to be a comprehensive program. So assisting with bike maintenance, um, encouraging people to use their own bikes, doing bike lanes, um, really working with the city on infrastructure. So that's where as a transit authority, we don't have a lot of um, involvement on the right of way, the city streets, that kind of thing. So keeping the city as a partner has been, is, is we think is going to be very helpful because we will really encourage bike usage as a whole. Um, Cause we share with the city of the goals of getting people out of their cars and, and commuting and traveling on any way possible outside of the single occupancy vehicle. And this is a really big piece to that. Next slide. Oh, and keep going. So um, right now, a quick overview of the program. We have um, 200 e-bikes, which are these little ones you see here, the white ones. They're just electric assist. They're not, uh, you still have to pedal. And we have 500 standard bikes, which are the standard pedal bikes, no electric assist. And then we have 75 stations. Uh, we, we've noticed that those 200 e-bikes carry the bulk of a lot of the trips that are um, happening. So we know that there's a huge future with e-bikes. The standard bikes, not so much. A lot of folks are not using those. They're just a lot harder to use. And we have some hills around here, so, and, and a lot of heat. So those have not been very popular, but the e-bikes, we get about four times uh, use for every uh, e-bike that we do for a pedal bike. Next slide. So um, again, what we learned is that uh, the manual bikes, they're bulky and heavier and less desirable. So our goal is to really boost the e-bike usage. We, uh, down the line, we plan on completely replacing the fleet and going 100% e-bike. Um, and then also we, we learned that in, while we have a lot of these micro mobility options like scooters and other types of things, the bikes have really been holding their own as it comes to um, things like the coronavirus. In fact, uh, our, as soon as the coronavirus hit, we noticed that um, all the bike ridership tanked. We also knew all the birds and limes and all the other scooters, they all just got pulled off the street. Well, um, it wasn't but about a week or so after uh, people started staying home that our ridership started going up without any much explanation. And uh, people found that getting around on bikes is actually a really good way to distance himself from others, but also get around. And so our ridership is actually above what it was before COVID. So we're really shocked but excited about that. Um, the other thing we learned is that the system is loved. It's, it's there, it's, you know, an old bike system, but a lot of people love it and a lot of people use it. So one of the things is we didn't want to come in and completely uh, turn over the apple cart and, and start from scratch. So we're really trying to be respectful of the current system and really adding to it rather than just um, taking it and shaking it up and making it our own. Um, and then again, like I've mentioned before, the roadways, sidewalks, the urban trails, bike advocates, private landowners, they all have a part in the conversation when it comes to bikes. And so, you know, when it comes to bikeways and, and, and encouraging these, this type of mode, you really need a lot of people at the table. And so with this partnership that we're developing, we are ensuring that we still have all of these people at the table. You know, whereas the bus system, we do our route planning, we do those kinds of things, we do some public meetings and that's that. But really with this, we really need to continue to have all the voices at the table. So that's been pretty interesting. Next slide. And then um, some of the main things is if, as you dig down, down deeper, some of the other lessons that we've learned uh, when it comes down to partnership is governance. Who's, who's in charge? Who has the final say of expansion and where play things go, especially when we're sharing 
the uh, the oversight and management of that with the city of Austin and the nonprofit. So we're working through that. Uh, we would probably take the lead on that, but we still want to again have people at the table working with us. And then the financial structure of the partnership um, as we grow and as we uh, put funds together into this program, you know, identifying who's going to be owning the assets, who's managing them, that kind of thing. We're working through those. I think we've gotten, come really far, but these are some final big picture things that we're, we're, we're figuring out, which are pretty good. I think we're in really good shape. Daily operations oversight, um, you know, as a transit authority, we're used to doing oversight for any of our service providers, you know, the MVs, first transits, MTMs, you know, whatever of the world. We do that with our daily operations because we contract out all of our bus and paratransit and rail operations. So we're used to that. So we would be taking on this oversight role where we're making sure the bikes are maintained um, and that they're up, um, the batteries are charged, they're swapped out, they're load balanced, that kind of thing, graffiti removal, that, that kind of stuff. So that's a, a new role for us. And then again, the asset ownership, that's just another thing that we're still trying to um, figure out as far as um, who owns the assets. It's not anything we're that you know concerned with. I think we, we know that as long as the assets are part of the program, that's the most important piece. But these are things to think through as you have this partnership that's very complex with two government entities and a nonprofit, and then all of the other uh, voices out there that wanna be at the table participating in the conversation. And next one, I think that's it for me. Um, oh yeah, I forgot our next steps. We do, um, so the reason why we haven't identified all of those is because we're still uh, figuring out our interlocal agreement with the city of Austin. We have uh, already gotten some initial approvals on that and we plan to bring that to our board of directors next month for final approval to get this actually kicked off and running. Um, and then in the fall, we'll have app payment integration with our app so you can buy one ticket and get um, both systems. We'll be doing the actual formal rebranding of the Metro uh, Bike program, changing it from B-Cycle to Metro Bike. And then in the fall, we'll be unveiling our, our big Metro Bike program. So uh, keep an eye out for that, that is coming. And that's pretty much all I've got for you today. Thank you, Chad, very much. Uh, this is a great presentation overview of the uh, integration of bike share to transit project for Cub Metro. Um, we're going to hear next from Indigo, and before we hear from Lauren and Austin, I want to remind everybody um, um, attending this webinar that you can submit your questions through the chat box um, in the lower part of your um, Zoom screen, um, and we're going to be addressing them at the end of the presentation. So Lauren and Austin, the floor is yours. Right, hi, good afternoon everyone. Uh, my name is Austin Gibble, I'm the project development planner with Indigo. Um, so I'm just gonna to start off before we get into uh, the agency and mobility hubs, I'm gonna kind of give a brief overview of what we're working with here in Indianapolis. Um, Indianapolis is the 14th largest city by population uh, in the United States. Um, we do have a merged city and county, and that gives us a very large land area of about 404 square miles. Um, there is some context here on the screen, but to even put that into more perspective, uh, the city of Los Angeles is about 500 square miles. So we're about 80% size, the geographic, 80% uh, the geographic size of Los Angeles with about one third the population. Um, we are 65th in total transit, transit supply and we are the third most expensive city to live in in terms of housing costs and transportation costs. Looking at housing costs, we look fairly affordable, um, but when you account for um, our current transit supply uh, and the amount of sprawl that we have uh, in a cost to vehicle ownership, it starts to add up and get very, very expensive. Uh, next slide, please. So here's what we have now. Indigo does have uh, a, a Pacers bike share, which is our, our local bike sharing network. Um, it is completely operated by a nonprofit. Um, one of three bus rapid transit lines has opened that are currently planned. That is the red line uh, serving as a north south spine. Uh, and we do have a local fixed route transit system. Um, however, the 
planned uh, grid system that we were hoping to switch to this year um, has been put on hold until at least next year uh, due to COVID-19 challenges. And that also leads us to what we want to become. We want to become more than just a transit agency. We want to become a mobility agency, sort of a one-stop shop for all mobility services in the city of Indianapolis and Marion County. Um, our our on-ramp process was uh, technical planning assistance for mobility hubs, which were, uh, in theory, these locations where transportation services could be co-located and also digitally integrated in terms of payment and planning. Um, we worked with the Shared Use Mobility Center on that front. Uh, we did have a brief uh, hiccup uh, when we lost one of our available transportation options, which was Blue Indy Car Share. That was an all electric car sharing program. Uh, and unfortunately they left the Indianapolis market in the spring of uh, earlier this year. And next slide. And this is where I will pass it off to my colleague, Lauren. Thank you, Austin. It was a great introduction of mobility hubs. Yes, so Indigo's on-ramp project was structured around asking for the city of Indianapolis, what are mobility hubs and then what do they look like? And with these individual mobility hubs, how can we geographically place them so that we create a mobility district, a way that you could, without owning your own vehicle, move where you need and want to go? So naturally, we had in mind four different land use um, patterns that we wanted to look at mobility hubs and how they would function in those different areas. And some see lovingly told us that we probably should pick one and that would be more than enough work. And of course they were correct. So we ultimately chose um, an urban core option that would um, include some locations that are gonna be along future rapid transit lines. And we'll, we'll get into that. But on top of co-locating modes that would both keep the transit as the backbone of the mobility network, but also allow you as an individual to reduce or eliminate your dependence on a vehicle. By working with the community development corporations that we did, we wanted these mobility hubs to also ask how could they reduce additional transportation barriers, mainly the cost and, and also the confidence of the user using new modes. Um, we know from experience that in Indianapolis, and I'm sure many of you who are in the field know that for someone who hasn't ridden the bus before in a long time, sometimes it's just helping them do that for the first time. Um, and then there's a pride in that and also a, a new confidence that will hopefully encourage them to, to choose different modes. So that was um, an additional goal of, of our on-ramp project. Next slide. So where did we start? Again, I mentioned we had several locations that we wanted to look at and ultimately knew that we needed to work with an invested neighborhood oriented partner. Um, and so with that, we worked with the Bonner Center and Inglewood CDC, which are on the near east side of Indianapolis. They are trusted, um, effective and really embedded in the neighborhoods already. Obviously anything that's going to involve a behavior change and really needs to react to what the community needs, we wanted to make sure that we were hearing from the community and already had those, those stakes in the ground. And um, the green that I have in the presentation are just notes of things that we learned or interesting tidbits that popped up. So in working with the partners and of course the agency um, and the other additional stakeholder and mode providers, we started realizing that priorities were varied. There was this conversation um, that for some really focused on the placemaking goals of these spaces. So could this be a neighborhood gathering space? Could it have a farmer's market? Um, does there need to be seating, fun for children? Um, and then again, on the other hand, several of the stakeholders were geared around the mobility operation. So that needs to be the core um, around which that the mobility hub is designed. So that was an interesting conversation um, that I would imagine would be similar for, for other cities. Um, the neighborhood in which we worked on the Near East side, you can see some statistics there. It is very transit rich, um, including future plans for rapid transit. It already has several high frequency transit lines, um, protect, protected bikeways. Um, scooter coverage and at the time of our planning car share 
and also a high percentage of individuals who do not have a car or who have um, one car in their household and have indicated that they are high transit users. And so then another good thing to, to always do, of course, is to really kick the tires. So we, looking at maps and the assets, um, origin, destination, frequencies, where we already had modes, could imagine and could predict some strong locations. And then during one of SUMSI's um, visit, site visits to Indianapolis, we really walked around and felt what it would feel like to be waiting for a mode there. Would you, does this make sense if you're in the neighborhood? What are the surrounding uses and how could we integrate with them or really make sure that we're thinking about as we build these hubs, what it means for, um, for the surrounding area. Next slide. So briefly, the process that we went through, um, the lead agency or entity here was Indigo, of course, the transit agency. So making sure that the goals of the locations and the orientation and functionality um, and also what is possible um, started, of course, with, with the transit provider there. Um, and then, of course, thinking about and pulling in what are the community priorities. We did this by looking at past research, um, Indigo onboard, ridership surveys, demographic information, and then we did additional surveying. We worked with the Bonner Center during their tax prep, um, where they really are face to face with residents. And we had a survey for them while they were waiting in line that helped to identify transportation barriers, perceived or real, um, once needs and likes, what are their, um, what's the access to internet, how would they feel about using a different mode if they could link it with another in a, in a trusted location. So really starting to understand the community priorities. Um, and again, some of those questions started boiling to the top of, you know, this would be great. This could be a place where we could also hold community meetings or um, incubate a bike shop, for instance, or a new farmer's market. So those community priorities and how those layer onto the kind of base functionality of a mobility hub was, was interesting and, and really fruitful and, and somewhat unexpected. Uh, we went through a SWOT. Um, again, I talked about suggesting or selecting some of the potential locations. And then of course, coordinating with those other critical partners. So the Department of Public Works had some projects underway that would have influenced how accessible or safe the pedestrian and bike experience would be in one location over another. So that played into the conversation of prioritizing those locations. And um, the other mode operators is of course key here and Austin alluded to it. We, at the time of planning, we had um, Blue Indy, which is an electric car share system. And it was, um, in quite a few of the potential locations nearby, at least, that we had originally scoped. And during this planning process, they announced that they were leaving and um, are, are now actually gone from Indianapolis. And so this brought to light a, a serious conversation. You know, is there value in one location over another? Is there value in these mobility hubs at this time without a variety of modes? Our bike share, for instance, doesn't go quite as far east yet. Um, we, this is in their capture area for their planned expansion in the future. But again, you know, if we have delays in some of these bikeways, if we don't have car share, if we don't have bike share yet, what, what does that mean for the, the mobility hub um, idea that we're thinking about? Next slide. And just to finish out the process, um, so after kicking the tires and our two site visits from SUMSI, uh, we had a workshop with the core stakeholders to narrow down these locations, um, a, redefine our pros and the worries about each, the goals of the overall project, and of course, pull in the uh, feedback that we gained from the community. And the, the community said, right, they wanted less time thinking about worrying about where they need to go. We know that as transit mobility providers, that our goal is to reduce those concerns and those barriers. Um, and so in having listening to the community and this workshop, the question came up, do we already have hubs, right? So 
we have locations where we have rapid transit, we have um, protected bikeways, walkways, we have bike share. Is this a short term win? Should we focus on branding what we see as maybe a low intensity hub um, and start teaching to what this could mean? Um, so that was a really interesting conversation and, and, and maybe something to follow along moving forward um, based on from where we are now. And then, of course, you know, we started talking about refining the financials and the responsible parties. This was a great conversation that some see led us through during one of their site visits. You know, you need to be thinking about who's in charge of the trash, trash collection, who is paying for and maintaining the technology. Um, how are you prioritizing modes and um, technology needs and, and all of that. So really interesting conversations that are certainly, certainly worth having and, and planning for. Next slide. And um, just a couple more lessons learned and, and some hiccups, which are to be expected. And Austin, chime in if I forget anything. Um, during, the, during this on-ramp process, which, which was wonderful, Indianapolis was also selected as one of uh, Ford's uh, City One Challenge communities. And so, that was another process, asking the community what their mobility needs are and wants, and then of course soliciting solution proposals um, and moving forward with that. And, and, and out of that came funding designated from the transit agency to pursue two pilot programs. And so some of the, the priorities and just what was possible with the many competing projects, and then of course COVID um, has um, kind of redefined the timeline for mobility hubs here in Indianapolis. Um, and then our local champion partnerships were paramount. We, this, this is a great, any project where you're working in the community and you're building deep partnerships and better understanding priorities um, is excellent. And really, as you're looking to building adoption and that behavior change and that comfort with the, with the new modes or, or whatever it may be, having that local champion and that partner there on the ground and that micro scale is, is really going to be important. Um, the cohesive branding and the idea that we already had mobility hubs was um, really kept coming to to the forefront and um, and I think that that's another huge opportunity that's still a very low-hanging fruit here in Indianapolis and we've seen Minneapolis go through that process recently. Um, certainly Mobility is changing, as we know, uh, all of the time. And so being flexible with um, the payment and integration for trip planning, um, the user experience, the connection and wayfinding that's integrated with um, what we already have here in Indianapolis for bikeways is, is of course, really critical. Um, the exit of Blue Indy was really a turning point in a little bit of a way. Um, it certainly reduced the attractiveness of some of certain sites. Um, but the city is going through a process now to identify what could be done with that infrastructure that's still in place and, and really hopefully there's an opportunity um, for the future. And as everyone out there is experiencing COVID-19 um, has halted and shifted in many ways our expected process moving forward. So, um, so of course, that's, that's certainly something that happened during this process. And for the next slide, I'm going to turn it back over to Austin. Super. Thank you, Lauren. Um, so what's coming up next for Indigo, uh, not just 2020, but also beyond? Uh, Indigo is in the process of developing a mobility position policy, um, outlining how we plan to approach future mobility efforts. The mobility hubs process uh, really informed our application for Accelerating Innovative Mobility, a grant that we, from the Federal Transit Administration. Um, we should find out more information about that in the future. But that essentially told us um, that mobility hubs need to be something beyond just physical uh, co-location. Uh, integration needs to go a step further. So we're looking at how do we integrate Indigo with other transportation providers, other transportation modes, um, and how do we link them with demand response providers in other counties? Uh, and how, do, how can we leverage that to fill gaps in our transportation network? And how do we do that to maximize the efficiency of our paratransit service? Um, which leads us into our paratransit COA, 
uh, and, and really plays into that uh, in terms of where is paratransit needed? Where can we use another mobility provider um, to fill a partial paratransit needs? Does it look like that? What does it look like? Um, right now, we don't have a full grasp on that. There's a series of options that could happen, but are, these are things that are being explored. Um, like I mentioned, the, the, the mobility hubs are really something that are evolving to not just something that is physical. Um, the departure of Blue Indy could end up being more of uh, an opportunity uh, than a challenge as the city looks for ways to uh, really leverage those spaces and control the curb uh, to become neighborhood assets either through placemaking or transportation or what have you. Um, Indigo will continue to function uh, or to uh, pursue upgrades to fixed route transit. I mentioned earlier that our gridded uh, bus network uh, redesign implementation will not happen until next year at the earliest um, due to challenges presented through COVID-19. Uh, we are also pursuing two additional bus rapid transit lines. The second will be the purple line uh, heading towards the northeastern suburb of Lawrence from downtown Indianapolis. That has been uh, committed for funding from the Federal Transit Administration uh, and we are also pursuing funding for the blue line bus rapid transit which will be an east-west corridor uh, from the small suburban town of Cumberland through downtown Indianapolis and to the Indianapolis International Airport. Uh, next slide, please. And that's it for us. Thank you very much, Lauren and Austin, for uh, the great description of the Mobility Hub project in Indianapolis. Um, everybody can see now their contact info in this last slide. Um, and I'm going to move to our last presentation for today's webinar. Uh, we're going to hear from Tompkins County. Um, I want to remind you one more time, uh, you can submit your questions on the Q&A box uh, on your Zoom um, screens, and we're going to be addressing them all at the end of uh, the Tompkins County presentation. With that, I'm going to let... Wen Zheng Li, take the floor. Okay, uh, thank you so much, Alvaro. Uh, I'll have a brief one. Um, hello, everyone. My name is Wen Zheng Li. Uh, I work as a project assistant of Hopkins County Mass Project last year. Uh, today, I will present the lessons learned from our Mass Project on behalf of the White Mingo, uh, who cannot make it today. Uh, thanks, for, thanks for giving me this opportunity. Uh, first, I'll give you some background. The top county is in the Finger Lakes uh, region of New York. It has 102,000 people, of which 54% uh, live in the Ithaca urban area, and 46% uh, uh, live in the surrounding rural towns. The top county is our regional growth center with increasing employment, uh, economic development, and population. 20% uh, or uh, 15,000 of the workforce commute in from outside of the county. Uh, Cornell University is the single largest employer uh, in the county. Okay, okay. Um, sorry. Okay, um, mobility as a service. In uh, 2018, with Hopkins County's acceptance into the on ramp program, uh, we were ready to work on our local mass concept. So why Topkins County, New York? Uh, because we have uh, unique strengths, um, including uh, 40 years, oops, sorry, including uh, 40 years uh, history of incremental mobility innovation and successful uh, collaboration. Uh, yeah. Oh, sorry. The last slide, this one. Yeah. Wait. Yeah. Done. It's a little bit of 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 a I'm gonna, I'm gonna. Yeah, the next slide, please. There you go. Okay. 
uh, the county has diverse mobility and uh, information services. Uh, the two unique services are Ithaca Car Share and Way2Go. Uh, the Ithaca Car Share is the oldest, the largest, and successful uh, community nonprofit car share in New York State. Businesses, uh, the public sector, and nonprofit agencies use car share to provide work related trips. Uh, car share has a low cost membership plan for low income households. Way to go operated by Cornell Cooperative Extension, uh, create a comprehensive community mobility education program to inform people of their mobility choices. Uh, Way to go also trains uh, employers and uh, human service agency staff about uh, mobility service to uh, advise their employees and plans. Okay, next step, please. Yeah. Uh, before our ramp, we describe our mass idea as a single uh, concept. Uh, some C advisors motivated us to objectively consider uh, facing the project. So we identified two phases and uh, proceeded with planning phase one, uh, which are planning uh, uh, building blocks for phase two. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, in uh, 2020, only the TCAT, uh, which is the county's bus service provider, and one of the three uh, commuter bus service stream real-time location data usable by apps. Uh, reliable trip planning will grow uh, when more service providers publish real-time data. Uh, the new app will publish all available mobility service data. At a minimum, uh, there will be um, one button phone call uh, directly to a uh, mobility operator or link to their app. Uh, we realize mobility services uh, evolve on their own time, so our new app may uh, encourage uh, faster evolution. Uh, next slide, please. Yeah. Um, could you like uh, our group click? Because, yeah. Uh, MAS is closely allied to increasing supply of mobility services, especially in rural communities. way to go is working with non-volunteer programs to increase the number of drivers and improve operations. Finger Lake Red Share TDM managers working regionally to increase the supply of Red Share uh, drivers to uh, reduce the number of single driver commuters. TCAT has a first mile, last mile pilot, which will be uh, deployed in fall this year. Uh, next slide, please. Yeah. Uh, Mass phase one will fund uh, TCAT's first mile, last mile pilot program, a second year in uh, 2022, to understand the feasibility of expanding services to other rural communities. And uh, next slide, please. Yeah. Uh, the way to go mobility education program will include the phase one elements to inform uh, county and regional uh, residents. The new uh, call center will operate 24 seven to help people plan trips and recover from trip failures. Multimodal uh, customer service will test the objective of supporting customers of all mobility services with a phased approach. We will face the uh, growth of membership in the Guaranteed Red program over time. Okay, uh, next slide, please. Next slide, yeah. Uh, during the um, RAM program, we learned about the business model canvas. It's a useful tool for organizing our ideas planning and documenting a project over time. Here you see is the phase one mass pilot business model canvas. Uh, it is a work in progress. Uh, it will involve throughout developing a business model. And the last slide about I know is the next is the business rest. Uh, our next piece, yeah. Uh, creating two phases to develop mass uh, allows us to uh, concentrate on um, work elements we understand well. Uh, phase one includes necessary building blocks for phase two. We rank uh, phase one as low rest, as we know exactly what works to do and how to do it. 
We also uh, we are also confident about phase two, even though we uh, don't have alternative solutions for phase two yet. But uh, we know there are potential uh, partners to achieve phase two in the future. And the last slide is about uh, the lessons learned. Uh, next, please. Yeah, uh, then click. Uh, we have four lessons from uh, RAM, uh, which when combined enable us to take a good idea and refine it into a successful one. Uh, so uh, first, uh, split the mass into two phases. Second, uh, select a lead agency for phase one. Third, advance uh, innovative practices in rural mobility and service delivery. Uh, last but not least, don't overpromise. So the on-ramp uh, give us time to uh, search mass idea from around the world and uh, consider how they related to our local concept of mass. Uh, listening to our on-ramp colleagues discuss their uh, challenges, broaden our perspective and the understanding of project outcomes. Uh, the SAMC staff uh, challenged our initial assumptions uh, for the better. So the combined on-ramp experience uh, contributed to us being uh, organized and prepared to apply for and ultimately be awarded the FTA IMI grant in March uh, 2020. And uh, that's all, thank you. And uh, the last slide is the contact information. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you very much, Wen Zhang, for presenting on the Tompkins County project uh, on mass. Um, so with that, we conclude the first part with the presentations and we're gonna move into the Q&A portion of the webinar. Um, so I'm gonna invite all the presenters to turn your cameras on if you want to. Um, and I'm also gonna um, invite my colleague at the Share Use Mobility Center, Prashanth, Prashanth Guru, Guru Raja, to join the conversation. Um, let's see if everybody's back on. And everybody who's attending the webinar, you can still uh, submit your questions via the Q&A. So one question that um, to start with from, from the chat box and um, so people are asking, like, given the way in which the private sector bike share companies and um, scooter companies have been shutting down during the pandemic uh, or are subject to financial interruptions, um, do you think that mobility, micro mobility needs to be in the hands of public transit to ensure that the service would be there when it is needed uh, for the people who need it? And I guess that this question goes specifically to Cap Metro, but we would also like to hear from Indigo, what's your situation regarding bike share as well as in um, Tompkins County? Sure, I can start. Um, I think it's an interesting question. I, I think if you had asked me that uh, four months ago, I would have said that's ridiculous. I don't know why we would need to worry about <laughs> things being resistant to um, this kinds of, of thing. But it has been a very interesting situation that, uh, that we've got the ability to keep things running just like the bus service. We have to keep that running and we've we've just, done some cleaning and we've done, you know, made sure we've done all the steps we can do to make it as safe as possible. And so I think if you start looking at it as like a public good, then, you know, maybe there's a, that's an interesting argument for it. But, you know, then again, if the, if the public sector is taking care of a, a lot of that, then maybe there's an option, you know, maybe there's room for both. This is Austin from Indigo. Um, I think that's a very interesting question and it's something that I've seen uh, passed around quite a bit, uh, particularly with the loss of uh, Blue Indy car share, which um, there were a lot of households that were able to go to single car households and or, or, or were at least uh, considering it um, and maybe are now not able to do that due to the loss of a car sharing program. and having services introduced, mobility service introduces, introduced through the public, or excuse me, through the private sector, um, and then being subject to those risks financially um, is very challenging. Uh, and maybe it's a conversation that does need to happen. Is, are there things that are better managed uh, under some sort of public entity rather than 
uh, private sector industries utilizing uh, or leveraging public sector, sector infrastructure. I think just for, for the sake of providing information to everybody, can you describe what is the bike share program in Indianapolis? Yeah, uh, that is Pacers Bike Share. Um, they are a nonprofit uh, and are independent from uh, the city of Indianapolis or any other public entity. Um, they run entirely, uh, and Lauren, correct me if I'm wrong, Lauren actually helped spin up the bike share program, um, but they operate entirely off of uh, donations and user fares, uh, as well as um, federal grant dollars for expansion. Great. And one thing, can you describe a little bit on the um, bike share yes. situation? Yeah, sure. Um, the um, coronavirus, um, it definitely have the very big impact on the our local uh, ride share program. Uh, actually, uh, two years ago, the Hopkins County have a contract with uh, land bags. So the land bags uh, introduced like uh, roughly uh, hundreds of bags to the uh, uh, urban downtown area. But uh, recently, they left. And uh, the reason is that uh, not only because of the coronavirus, but also because uh, they, uh, in uh, the Hopkins County area in New York State, the uh, bike share program can only have uh, six months of operating their activities. Uh, well, for the next uh, uh, six months, uh, they cannot like uh, earn money from our uh, local area. So uh, I think the Hopkins County is uh, relatively small uh, in terms of uh, have a collaboration with a uh, private company. So uh, what we are proposing to do uh, at this time is that uh, we just get an original idea to develop a local uh, like uh, bike share program that uh, it will be a nonprofit and uh, uh, managed by the local mobility community. So uh, uh, yeah, and uh, that will uh, like save a lot of money. For example, the, we can have uh, the local high school students to prepare the bags and uh, to recruit uh, the local people to uh, relocate the, the bags, which is uh, very expensive for the land bag to do that. And uh, that will be a uh, very easy. That will be much easier to uh, operate this uh, bag share system uh, in terms of uh, relatively small capacity. Yeah. Hey, thanks. Um, a follow-up question regarding integration of biking uh, to uh, this mobility ecosystem, right? Um, so it's a two part question. One that goes to all the panelists is um, thinking about how integration of different mobility modes can foster equity in terms of fares. Um, so what are the initiatives that you're taking in terms of not only integrating modes, but also thinking about how that will impact on um, fares and, and if there are going to be um, options for, for low income population. Um, so let's start with that one. Whoever wants to take the lead. Um, I could. I, um, yeah, I, um, so when it comes to you know, equity in the fares, I think with any of these types of programs, like a bike share program, we do have a, a low income. Um, type of option. And I think that's going to be pretty much standard for any of these types of programs. So I think we've got it at $5 for an annual pass, something incredibly low. And if uh, people can't afford that, then we also have a, a ability to waive the $5, but that's, you know, significantly lower than what the cost would be, but that ensures that everyone has access so that the, the your access to the transit shouldn't be because you can't afford it. So we really want to make sure that that's not, that's not, the barrier. There's so many other barriers to getting people onto transit or bike shares and that kind of thing. And, and, the, and the financial equity piece shouldn't be one of them. So um, that's, that's at least the equity piece. I think, um, you know, uh, yeah, I'll just leave it there. I'll let others talk. <laughs> this is Austin over at uh, Indigo again. Um, equity has uh, long been a concern for us. Uh, the bike share program does have a, a low income access program. Um, Indigo, however, has long relied on paper passes uh, with the majority of sales being at the door of the bus. There were only a small handful of locations where you could purchase them at retail. Um, and that was at our downtown facility or in two or three uh, other retail locations. Um, that 
posed a, a major problem. Um, a day pass was $4 uh, and a monthly pass was $60. And a good chunk of our ridership is unbanked and could not afford to drop down $60 or take the time to go to wherever they needed to go uh, in order to drop that $60 down on a monthly pass. And so they were paying $4 a day to ride the bus. Um, and ultimately that led a lot of individuals to paying almost twice the cost of a monthly pass uh, over the course of a month. And that was uh, simply not doable. Um, so as we roll out our new fare collection system, our tap card and our retail network, um, we are implementing what is, uh, what is known as fare capping uh, to prevent that situation from happening as much as possible and allowing individuals to reload their cards with cash at retail locations and also kind of have that fare capping benefit so they are not spending more than what they have to on a transit pass. Mm -hmm. And uh, this is Wen Zheng Li from Topkins County. Uh, what I want to say is that the mask program in Topkins uh, County uh, uh, is uh, our target customer is the uh, transportation vulnerable people, including those uh, elder people and people with disabilities and low income population. So uh, right now, our uh, car share program has a, a, a special package for the low income uh, users. And uh, also the, uh, the land back who left, uh, they have like uh, incredible uh, low price for the uh, low income users. Yeah. And uh, that is uh, what we have. And uh, in terms of the uh, integration, and uh, we we are now uh, thinking about, like uh, you know, uh, the uh, normal price uh, for a monthly bus pass is uh, forty bucks. And uh, so, uh, if uh, people like uh, participate in our mass program, they'll think about uh, like uh, buy the uh, bus pass for the whole year uh, for the customers because it's a full year price is. Uh, $400, but if you buy it uh, month by month, it will be like uh, $480. So uh, the problem is that uh, some low income population they can just afford, uh, they can just afford the monthly pass. They don't have the money to pay like a $400 a time. So uh, this, uh, so uh, it just we just got this idea like uh, to uh, make our uh, mass program be sustainable. You know. To save money for the low-income population. Great, thanks. Um, we have a, another question that touches on equity, and this time related to the spatial mismatch, right? Like uh, that's something that Indigo uh, talked during the presentation. Uh, also true for Austin, uh, a city that is growing so rapidly, and uh, a challenge that we also seen in, in Tompkins County, trying to bridge the gap between the rural areas and and the core of the small town. So. Um, the question for all three is like, how are your projects addressing the uh, spatial mismatch uh, between, you know, the different um, uh, the, the, um, access to uh, jobs and, um, you know, um, and the uh, housing options? Um, I guess uh, I'll, I'll stop going first, I swear. <laughs> um, I think it is a really interesting question and that's one that we've been focused on. We've, this uh, current bike share system that we have is really focused on the downtown area and areas that are rapidly gentrifying or just are already pretty unaffordable for people to live. So it's great if you get on the bus and you can get to this part of town and then you can use the bike share system to get around. But um, you know, one of the main focuses that we're going to be uh, pushing for is bringing these bike shares to uh, more equitable parts of town, so lower income parts of town. Um, and I think that's a really important role that transit has. You know, when, if these were private companies, they would have every incentive not to bring them to affordable parts of town. Um, probably, you know, areas where you can't get peak ridership, where you can't get, you know, those kinds of things. We see those problems with uh, transportation network companies, the Ubers and Lyfts, that kind of stuff. And so the role of transit is to really be cognizant of that. And I think that that's, that's a really good fit for transit because we're pretty good at uh, not making a ton of money. We generally lose, you know, we're not a money-making venture. Public transit isn't, never really has been. So um, it, it, we are really focused in on that and we're okay with, you know, maybe not making 
you know, peak amount of money on this type of system in order to make sure that it's equitably shared around in the areas that need it the most. Um, so this is Austin. Um, Indianapolis has a, a, a very big challenge as it relates to the spatial mismatch between jobs and housing. Uh, uh, we have a lot of entry level jobs and logistics jobs um, that have rapidly suburbanized while the labor market has uh, tended to stay within the central city. Uh, and that makes it very, very difficult for these labor markets to reach these jobs, especially if they cross county lines. Uh, outside of Marion County and Johnson County, um, the Indianapolis metro area, our suburbs have no fixed route transit service. It just doesn't exist. Um, there are a handful of workforce shuttles that reach some of the logistics jobs, um, but it's still certainly very, very challenging uh, to, to reach these suburban jobs. Uh, and sometimes even within our own county to reach them uh, due to some of the, the spread out nature uh, of how how we've simply built ourselves over the past several decades and the mobility hubs uh, planning practice really informed our decisions around AIM to think how can we bridge that spatial gap uh, between where the labor market is and where these job opportunities are. Um, hi, uh, this is uh, Lin Jing Li from Texas County. Uh, I think the spatial mismatch is uh, especially of case uh, in the rural area of Texas County, and uh, uh, we have mismatch uh, between the housing and the work, and also the mismatch of the accessibility to public transportation. So uh, what we do, uh, we propose to do is to develop a multimodal trip planning program, uh, because currently we have like uh, 5,000 uh, commuter, uh, no, it's like uh, 15,000 uh, commuters outside of the county to uh, go to uh, the top two county to work every day. So uh, what we will do is that we will uh, develop the app to provide uh, seamless uh, services to these kind of uh, long, uh, long distance commuters. Uh, so they can find uh, like the time schedule and uh, which bus will come. So uh, in terms, uh, so that that's uh, depend on the real time uh, location system. And then uh, in terms of the uh, rural mobility accessibility, so uh, our coping strategy is that uh, we will uh, develop the, uh, we will increase the supply of rural mobility services uh, by uh, like uh, foster the local uh, volunteer uh, transportation services and uh, also the uh, local uh, ride share program. And currently we have uh, nine volunteer driver programs and uh, our uh, community has a uh, finger lake ride share uh, program that serves the local community for the uh, ride share and uh, carpool one pool uh, that is good and uh, certainly we have a TCAT first mile last mile program uh, that is uh, will develop a demand response service to the uh, uh, local uh, uh, residents that is uh, deviated from that is far away from the fixed route uh, bus uh, you know, yeah. Right. Thanks. Um, do you have a couple of quick questions for Chad? Um, people are interested in um, knowing more about the difference in cost between e-bikes and pedal bikes. And if you can expand a little bit on the uh, Metro bike governance, especially regarding the transfer of assets. Yeah, the, um, the, the standard pedal bikes are actually fairly expensive as well um, because they're very they're they're very sturdy bikes uh, the electric bikes aren't that much more expensive I'd say probably 30 40 30 35 percent more expensive um, I think the real expense is going to be down the road as we are switching out batteries and we're you know maintaining the batteries because we'll um, probably you know you those those uh, standard pedal bikes have been on the on the road since uh, 2013 and they're, they're battle hardened, they're out there and they, they haven't really required a ton of maintenance. Um, so I know in the long run it's gonna be um, doing the, the maintenance and, and the ongoing, and especially when it comes to the electricity um, and, and charging and load balancing those, those batteries. And the um, governance, is that what we were talking about? The governance just. Yeah, especially regarding the transfer of the assets. Yeah. So the so city of Austin currently owns those assets, and 
we haven't transferred those assets. In fact, we are we are still they're still remaining a partner so that they can still retain those assets because we we just didn't have a, a clear mechanism to have them gift us you know a few million dollars worth of bikes. Um, and so they're going to remain part of that. And so the ownership of that is really going to be sort of held at almost like a third governmental entity. We've got uh, where we'll have an account and we'll have sort of a governance structure where we've got sort of like a board of directors kind of thing that you can kind of think of that does the oversight and they manage the, um, the strategic pieces of that um, that agreement, but if we were say to put in a million dollars for additional e-bikes, we would just contribute that to sort of that group. Um, if the city of Austin does that, they'll contribute it to that group. And so we don't have a requirement to own 50% of the assets or the city of Austin owns all the assets. We're kind of keeping it flexible at this, at this point. I know that's a kind of a messy answer, but it's been a lot of work to try to legally make all of this work um, without having to kind of redo everything. Great. Um, and another question, kind of building up on the first one, but the other way around. Um, we've been talking a lot about mobility options, uh, you know, integrating mobility options, uh, especially, you know, through transit agencies and, um, and different programs. The question that is being asked now is how do transit agencies accommodate privately owned vehicles, let's say a private bike or a private scooter? to integrate or to be able to, um, you know, uh, be part of that mobility options without necessarily be part of a program that is run by the city, the agency or a non-for-profit organization. Yeah, that's a, that's a really good one. And, you know, I, I mean, from our perspective, anything and every, everything that's out there, we want people to use ideally other than a single occupancy vehicle. So we, we've really been looking at trying to integrate that into our app as well as the transit app, you know, making sure these integrations are done. Um, we don't really technically care how you get your information. We just think it's really important that all of these, you know, so you've got all of these APIs, all of these plugins from all of these different providers. We've been trying to get them into our app, but we, we struggle because we have some companies that, you know, are, you know, fly by the night or they don't stick around for too long or they don't want to uh, open up any of their um, data sources to a level that we would want. Um, and so, you know, we, we kind of struggle getting a one cohesive place where you can tra trip plan every single thing, including, you know, your Ubers and Lyfts and everything else. Um, but that, that has been a struggle. But we do think that, you know, any of these modes are good as long as you're getting out of the vehicle. Once you kind of untie your hands from the, the single occupancy vehicle, suddenly you have a lot more options. And any of these options are going to work for different times, you know, car share and everything. So kind of our, our our thought on it awesome indigo has any perspective yeah. to share there yeah so um we don't have any necessarily app integration in our trip planning just yet um however we do accommodate bikes on all of our buses um on the local bus routes we have three racks on the front of the bus on our bus rapid transit routes there are two racks on the inside of the bus uh, and we passengers can roll on and roll off their bikes through the rear door. Um, and there are also bike racks at every bus rapid transit station. Thanks. One thing, do you wanna chime um, in? Yeah, I, um, I think uh, the top two county situation is uh, very similar to the Indian goal. Uh, they have the fast rack uh, in front of the bus, uh, they have three slots for them. And uh, I think that is uh, all we have currently. Okay, great. Um, we're gonna switch a little bit to a different type of question, more on the financial side and partnership. So, um, Somebody from the public is asking um, if any of you have considered to create public-private partnerships as a funding mechanism. Uh, if not, why not? And if so, how is that process proceeding? I can. Uh... I guess. Go ahead, Jeff. You, can, you can take the lead. Go ahead. Yeah, we, you know, we think that, uh, you know, obviously a, a, 
pri public private partnership is a really great idea if we can make it work. Um, what we've been doing is we've been having the city take the lead on a lot of these things, especially when it comes to um, like uh, mobility centers, mobility hubs. They own the right of way and they control the right of way. And so um, any lands that we own, we're open to, you know, doing some type of uh, public private partnership. But when it comes to the, uh, the areas that we put our bus stops, we don't own them. We just have access and, the, and permission to um, use those, but we have very limited uh, permissions. And so we have talked with the city on how to move forward to find that, to use that as an extra funding mechanism specifically for this bike program. So it's on our radar, but um, getting this thing up and running has been our top priority. Andy? Do you, are you pursuing any public-private partnership as a funding mechanism? No, we're not at this point for mobility hubs. Um, yeah, we're not. Okay, Wen Zhang? I think uh, Topsons County is, uh, uh, they have a pretty small, uh, so uh, no, we, we don't have this. Uh, think about this. Yeah, we haven't think about this yet. Awesome. Um, I do have a quick follow-up question, Chad, for you regarding the cost uh, uh, between e-bikes and regular bikes. Uh, what would be the difference in cost for the rider, not just from the procurement process, or but for the rider, um, would it be a differential rate for using electric bike bikes versus uh, regular bikes? For us, we are charging the same rate, uh, which is probably why we have four times the usage on our e-bikes than we do our regular bikes. Um, but, uh, and, and we only have 200 of our 700 bikes that are e-bikes. So, um, you know, I, I think a lot of people go hunting around. I know I do. And I'm, when I'm looking for a bike, I'll sometimes wait and walk to the next bike station just because I want the e-bike instead of the pedal bike. But uh, our hope is that we'll make the whole system e-bikes. If we were to maintain a split system with manual and e-bikes, we might consider a split cost differential, but we plan on moving to all e-bikes. So we're going to keep the, the price the same. And it's also, you know, it's probably all going to be pretty darn cheap because <laughs> uh, we have a pretty heavily subsidized bus system. Thanks for that. Um, another quick one. Um, have any of you considered or evaluated uh, dock versus dockless um, bike options and which were the key drivers behind your decision? That's been a big one for us. Uh, ours is a completely docked system. Um, I know there are a lot of benefits to having a dockless system. And uh, we've had a lot of back and forth at the, the politician level. A lot of folks really do not want the uh, dockless ones um, because of perceived, you know, urban trash and that kind of thing, you know, having the bikes and scooters and everything lying around. We have a lot of that already. Um, and so um, we had talked about it. We, we've, we, it's, we're even open to it in the future, but if we were to do a docked and dockless, that's when we would have the variable cost difference. So we might let you uh, park your vehicle in a dockless scenario but maybe you have to pay a little more to do that um because we really do want to encourage uh people to use the docks it, it just it keeps things out of the way for um wheelchair accessibility that's one of the big things is the accessibility of the pathways um, especially when you're doing this near a bus stop and a lot of people are using them at bus stops some folks will throw down scooters and they'll walk away and, and then people in wheelchairs will have a really hard time getting around and so uh, for the accessibility purposes, we think it's better for a dock for a dock system. But as a user, it would, it's great to have a dockless one, though. But there's just some there's some uh, pluses and minuses on that. In the end, Tompkins, any any comment on the dockless versus the docked bike system? I know in Indianapolis, part of the conversation around docked versus dockless is, you know, when you have a docked system, there's a confidence that you know where the stations are and where the bikes are going to be and where you need to take the bike. And that was something that uh, Indianapolis Cultural Trail Incorporated, the group that runs the bike share program, felt strongly was, was still really lending itself to the behavior change and the adoption and then repeat ridership here in Indianapolis. 
Um, in Tartus County, uh, we had a uh, land bag, which is a dog license system. And uh, uh, the major concern for this is that uh, the relocation is uh, very uh, costly and the land bank have to spend a lot of money for this. And uh, at the same time, the, uh, there's some uh, like secure, uh, security uh, concerns, like uh, people like probably put uh, the bag uh, anywhere and uh, uh, the drivers uh, dislike this. And that is uh, our concern. And uh, in terms of the dog uh, faction uh, system, uh, I think it's uh, very uh, like uh, safe and uh, easier to uh, maintain. But on the other hand, uh, uh, people have uh, lower accessibility to the bags because they have to like go to the like, the bag station to get the bag and they return it back to you know. So uh, there's some concerns for this. And uh, yeah, uh, since the limb bag is has already left and. Uh, uh, we need to develop our community-based uh, lab uh, pack share system, and this kind of issue is uh, under discussed. Yeah. Great, thanks. Um, we're almost at the end of uh, the time for this webinar. So as a um, go-away question, uh, the last one that I'm going to ask to three of you, and it's also a segue in preparation for our next week webinar, um, is to what extent does the integration of transit and bike share and other modes uh, require people to reconsider their physical habits uh, in a similar way to getting people to walk more to little further to transit or um, like more walking or less waiting uh, for a more ridership focused type of system. This is in uh, Lauren Day at Indigo. When, when Indigo is undergoing its COA, one of the questions that we had for a lot of our riders and potential future riders was, were you willing to walk a little bit further if it meant that you didn't have to wait as long for your bus? And the answer was overwhelmingly yes. And that led, of course, to the 80-20 ridership coverage model that will be implemented over the next few years. And we've talked about this in Indianapolis a lot. You know, we're having this conversation about the why walking is important and sort of not that, that less of a, being a negative, you know, oh, I have to walk further, but, you know, making sure that one, we're of course providing options for individuals who may um, not be as mobile, but also reframing what it means to have to walk a little bit further and the benefit that could come from that. Maybe it's access to multiple modes, um, a more enjoyable trip or more frequent service. Chad? Yeah. We are, we, um, you know, we, as we started doing this, we started to realize that we were really focusing on, you know, kind of getting people around on transit and not really thinking about how people really use the multitude of the services. So we actually are identifying what people are already doing. And we just finally have made the connection in our, in our, um, on paper and in our heads that, you know, a lot of our customers are already doing this, but now we just need to make it easier. So it was one of those things where we actually started paying attention to what they're doing. We had mapped on a GIS map of where people were, the origins and destinations of all these bike trips that were centered right around our bus stops. And we we're like, you know, this is nuts. People are, people are using these systems and we're just, we're ignoring it. We're not really, we haven't really been doing anything about it. So that was one of the things is we think that this isn't, we're not really asking a lot of people to make a big change on how they, how they move. We're actually just trying to facilitate what they're already doing and hopefully bringing more people into the fold by doing that. Um, kind of listening to the customers, which is something we're not probably that great at doing as public transit agencies. Um, so that's, that's what we've been doing is kind of listening to what they're doing and hopefully making that connection that's already been there, but formalizing it, making it easier. Mm -hmm. Um, for the uh, top this case, uh, I want to say that our per, uh, the target customer is the transportation vulnerable population. So they are now facing the uh, the lack of accessibility to public transit, and uh, that meaning that they have to pay a lot of money uh, to uh, probably take a, a taxi, or they cannot uh, go to the uh, bus stop. So that is the issue. And uh, what we want to uh, recommend is the uh, multimodal trip planning program. And also uh, in this case, the people can 
uh, increase their accessibility by uh, volunteer driver program, the ride share program. And uh, so uh, this kind of system can make people easier to uh, get access to the public uh, transit system. And uh, yeah, that is uh, from, it's not about like a uh, walk uh, more or less, it's about like, um, I can't get access to, I can't get access to this. No, this is like a uh, very uh, positive change. Great, Don. Thank you, thank you very much. Um, we are reaching the end of our webinar. I wanna thank uh, all our presenters today uh, for sharing uh, your experience and lessons learned from the on-ramp uh, projects that you've been uh, developing and now move into implementation. I want to thank everybody for attending this webinar. Remind you that we're going to be hosting the second part of uh, this webinar series next Tuesday at the same time. That's June 20th. Um, and we're going to be talking about first last mile uh, mobility on demand projects. Um, thank you everybody again. Uh, stay safe and healthy and see you next week. <laughs>